there's always no pressure being the evening's anthropologist. Um, so how do you follow all of that, right? And how do you think about AI in this context of rights and liberties? And I really wanted to kind of move this conversation in a slightly different direction. Think of this as the kind of meta moment before drinks, which I'm assured are outside and there's an open bar. And you should never put Australians between this and an open bar. So how do you start, right, in thinking about AI in the context of rights and liberties? Well, I think you have to start at first principles, which is how do you define it? You heard Kate and Meredith stand right on the stage here and say the thing about AI is it's a complex of technologies that include everything from machine learning to computer vision to natural language processing. You've also heard them stand on this stage and indeed one a year ago and say, but the other thing about AI is it's also a constellation of cultural and social practices. And that turns out to be hugely important when you want to talk about it in the context of rights and liberties because those are also intensely cultural and social practices. So how as an anthropologist would you want to define AI? It's one thing to say it's social and cultural, but how do you give that a little bit more specificity? How would you put a little bit more tension on that system? Well, one way to do it would be to go look at the kind of classic anthropologist, go get a bit of Claude Levi-Strauss and say, okay, if artificial intelligence is on one side, what's on the other side? Organic emotion? I don't know what the oppositional point would be, but you'd kind of go the raw and the cooked, you know, AI and the other thing. You could certainly subject it to a kind of classic William Spradley ethnographic interview and ask AI to describe itself descriptively, structurally, with a contrast question, and you'd get somewhere sort of interesting. I also think there's another slightly different kind of anthropological but critical theory lens you could take on this, which is to think about AI as having marked and unmarked categories. So what do I mean by that? Well, you heard a couple of examples about that earlier in these kind of conversations about Let's pick, for instance, scientists. Scientist, we frequently add the descriptor female scientist because the understanding is that scientists writ large are male and female scientists are the exception. They're the marked category. The unmarked category doesn't need a descriptor, right? It's just taken as read. But when you put that marked category in front of the word, you open up its meaning. So I want to do that to AI and just suggest four words you could put in front of AI that might illuminate its unmarked categories by attempting to mark it. And because I've recently moved home, I thought I'd start by saying, well, is AI Australian? And you're all laughing because you know the answer is no way. And how do we know that? Well, firstly, we know that because our fine, fine and now somewhat distressed colleagues at Volvo, I hasten to add Sweden, brought their autonomous car to Australia and discovered a really critical thing. Caribou are not at all like kangaroos. They may both be animals that lurk by the side of the road, but they behave completely differently. Kangaroos bounce in the air. Apparently, the bouncing in the air bit makes it very hard to determine this plane, which means that Volvo's cars run into them. Problem. So the AI there, it had a country, and the country wasn't mine. The country also turns out not to be yours because deer and caribou aren't the same either. But when you put a country in front of AI, you already start to ask the question of whose AI is this? We talk about rights and liberties. Whose rights and liberties do we imagine we are enshrining? I love the idea that the Bill of Rights is a document of inefficiency, but it's only one country's document. And what would it mean to think about everyone else's? So if AI has a country, where is that country and does it matter? And of course the answer is yes. But how would you unpack that and start to suggest other countryness? You could also, in the context of rights and liberties, ask the question of, well, does AI have an activity base to it? Are we talking about an equity AI? What would that look like? Would that be the AI that managed the Fox News sexual harassment problem? Would that be the AI that ensured that women's pay wasn't calibrated by historic pay data? Would that be an AI that was interventionist? And if it was, whose intervention would it be? How would you determine what equity was? Who would make that determination and how would it be read into the system? And frankly, putting that word in front of it also starts to suggest what does it mean to say that the data isn't enough anymore and that training an algorithm on a piece of data may only get you what the world has been, not what the world needs to be or the world should be. So the second question you might ask here is not just where is AI's country, but where is AI's context? And in some ways, it's always an already retrospective. And so how you would make it prospective is actually a really interesting question. Third, what you could put in front of it just for fun would be to say Buddhist AI, question mark. Now, of course, there's some 
a couple of things about that that's important. One is that artificial intelligence does sound incredibly well agnostic or atheist, just as a starting point. It also, however, has embedded in it some ideas that come out of arguably not just a neoliberal tradition, but possibly a Christian one. There's a notion inside AI about systems being autonomous. There's some lurking notions about free will. There are certainly ideas about systems becoming sentient and self-aware. All of those are interesting ideas that aren't just cultural, they are cultural and religious. What would it mean to talk about a Buddhist AI? One of my favorite Japanese roboticists wrote a book nearly 30 years ago in which he argued, I would say slightly tongue in cheek, but mostly not, that robots, i.e. the thing that goes around AI, that robots would be better Buddhists than human beings because they were capable of infinite patience and infinite grace. You might also argue that if you were to talk about a Buddhist AI, could you talk about an artificial intelligence that was co-emergent with us, where there is no us and them, there is a co-emergent set of properties, and what would that look like? And frankly, you could put any other religion in front of this. What would it mean to talk about a Lutheran AI, an AI of submission, not autonomy? <laughs> and not in that sense, in the Lutheran sense. And then last, but by no means least, what might it mean to talk about an emancipated AI? We spend a lot of time talking about autonomous systems, about what it will mean to be safe with autonomous systems, how AI will be safe for us. There is a question about whether we would get to a point where a system and a society was judged by how it treated its artificial objects, not the other way around. And what might it be to imagine that autonomous systems aren't autonomous but emancipated? What does that start to look like, right? So what are the things I'm suggesting here about marked and unmarkedness? One is that every time we say AI, there are a set of implicit, tacit, cultural assumptions that are unvoiced. But you can get at them by starting to push on the system. I could just as easily have put here queer theory, AI, loved up AI, democratic AI, totalitarian AI, because all that does is help us ask the question of what is AI really and what might we want from it, and how do we have that conversation inside the broader context of rights and liberties. So thank you.